Welcome to this online worship service at Christ Alone Lutheran Church in Mequon and Thienesville, Wisconsin. On this fourth weekend in Advent, we are putting ourselves into the shoes of those early saints, those Jewish believers who were filled with excitement and anticipation at the thought that the Messiah, the Savior, the Christ would be coming. And whether it's listening to the prophet Micah speak about the place of his birth, or whether it's hearing the Virgin Mary exulting in God her Savior for, his, her, for her blessing, we ourselves are finding ourselves wrapped up in that excitement. And I pray that listening in today fills your heart with joy too as you anticipate the coming of your King. As we begin today, let's listen as the choir sings for us the song, The Angel Gabriel from Heaven Came. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins. And trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
we join in the prayer of the day. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come. Take away the burden of our sins and make us ready for the celebration of your birth, that we may receive you in joy and serve you always. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading for this day, this fourth Sunday in Advent, is from the prophet Micah, chapter 5, beginning at verse 2. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be our peace. This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading is the epistle for this day. This is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, beginning at verse 5. Words that will also serve as the focus for today's sermon. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. First, he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings, you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, here I am. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made, been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. The word of the Lord. Let's now listen as we hear the solo, Would I Miss a Miracle?
The Holy Gospel today is recorded in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 1, beginning at verse 39. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him. From generation to generation, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. The Gospel of the Lord. We now listen as the group Koine presents the beautiful Advent piece, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel.
it come and open wide our heavenly home. Make safe the way that leads on high and close the path to misery. Grace and peace to you in the name of him who comes to set us free, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In a season known for gift giving, I wonder what you will consider the best gift you received. Is it jewelry, clothes, tools, an appliance, a toy? Whatever it is, I bet it won't be some kind of flesh. And it certainly won't be a a human body wrapped up in shiny paper. That all sounds way too macabre, uh, like it's out of a horror story. But this is no horror story. Would it surprise you if I told you the best gift God could have ever given this world is a body for his precious son? That's what he tells us in this challenging section of his holy word in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10. And I challenge you to take seriously for yourself why this gift allows your heart to fly above its daily sorrows and frustrations, its guilt and sorrow, with incredible joy, all because of a body. Let's remember first what we're talking about today. The prophet Micah has just powerfully powerfully foretold that the Messiah of Israel, God's anointed Son and Savior, would come in the flesh from King David's own ancestral home, Bethlehem in Ephrathah. Then we heard Mary sing her song of praise, overwhelmed that God chose her to bring that king into the world to be ruler in Israel. God's plan is written all over this. He loved this world, devastated as it was by sin and death, and would not hold it at arm's length, Man could never save himself. God would come into it, into this world, to champion righteousness and salvation. Let's consider three things that this text spells out for us. First, the law of Moses demanded the sacrifice of a body. The writer to the Hebrews was quoting something that these Jewish Christians would be pretty familiar with. This is the book of Psalms, and particularly Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8. Recall these words you heard earlier. First, he said, Sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. It's nearly impossible to appreciate the beautiful news of the gospel of Jesus, unless you first understand the law of Moses. Now, this gets a bit gory. It's a fact that Moses' laws demanded regular burnt offerings for sin. In other words, the animals that they raised, the sheep, the goats, the lambs, the rams, and and even the mighty bulls, were at least in part used at the tabernacle in the desert or the temple in Jerusalem. They were first slaughtered which involved the shedding of their blood. To this day, Jews will never eat meat that has blood still in it, because in Moses' laws, the blood was sacred. The life of the animal is in the blood, God said. 
It was to be captured in a bowl and used in sacrifice to be sprinkled on the altar and even sprinkled on the people. Then the body or portions of it were to be burned up on the altar as an offering to God. The air would be filled with the smoke and smell of burning flesh. One of the important functions of the priests of Israel was to oversee these regular sacrifices of animals. So why did God command his people to sacrifice animals? It was, in his words, to make atonement for the sins of the people. In other words, all of this death, all of this bloodshed, was a vivid demonstration that the sins of human beings, whether sins of being or sins of doing, or even sins of not doing, brought about a debt before God, a spiritual debt that must be paid in order for humans to live at peace with the Almighty God. Couldn't he just overlook sin? Well, that's a little like asking the judge in the case of Daryl Brooks, who drove his truck into the Christmas parade, killing six and wounding dozens more. It's like asking him, can't you just overlook what he did? Can't you just say he's innocent? Absolutely not. Justice demands payment for a crime. That truth is deeply rooted in the human heart. Even more, it's rooted in God's heart of perfect justice. Does that truth make you just a little nervous? God is just. He does not tolerate your sin, not even a little bit of it. If you keep the whole law but disobey it at just one point, the Apostle James says you are guilty of breaking it all. Justice demands the wrath of God. In Moses' law, that wrath would be taken out on a real flesh and blood animal, not some pretend one, not a plastic one. But here's the real kicker. God says he never really desired burnt offerings and sin offerings. They were not the issue. What he wanted was the heart of his people. Though the law demanded many sacrifices, they were nothing if they did not come from a heart that truly loved God, his justice, and his mercy to offer as a sacrifice the bloody body of a sheep, but then gossip about someone or humiliate your spouse or move a boundary stone so as to steal a neighbor's property or a thousand other offenses against the law made God hate and reject their sacrifices. So often, serving God just sometimes becomes a matter of trying to look, God by doing the, look good by doing the right thing going to church, giving money to charity, taking the Lord's Supper, celebrating the holy days, going to confession. But the heart, it's gone. And everything else becomes meaningless in God's eyes. In fact, God detests it. It's clear we need something much more than just ceremonies. So God gives us something better. You could say, and this is the second point that the writer brings up, that Christ completed God's will in the body. Think about these words about God's promised Savior, his son Jesus. Therefore, the writer says, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. These are the words of God's own son, spoken prophetically through the mouth of King David. Clearly, it's someone far greater than David, who often showed that he did not do God's will as he should. But the greater King David was speaking here, the son of David, Jesus Christ. He said, a body you prepared for me. God fulfilled his promise of sending his son physically in the flesh for human beings who were here physically in the flesh of sin. Note three things he acknowledges. First, here I am, as if to say, hey, planet Earth, despite all your wretchedness, I didn't stay away from you. I'm here for you. I love you people. Secondly, he is written about in the scroll, the written word of God, 
what we call the Bible, the book. How often didn't Jesus exult in the written word of God? He's the one who said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them listen to them. He's the one who said to the saddened disciples on the day of his resurrection, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have written. He is the one who opened the minds of his disciples to understand the scriptures when he said, this is what is written. And so it must be the Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. He insisted that that Bible was all about him. But about him doing what? Well, that's the third thing. I have come to do your will, my God. What God demanded in his law, the righteous life, the perfect performance of God's will, human beings in their sin are completely helpless to do. The law crushes our pride with its thundering demands, but it never crushed Christ. In fact, he satisfied the demands of the law completely, perfectly. He came to do God's will as the world's only perfect human being. He told his disciples, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. He said in John chapter 6, I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. And what was that will? For this is the will of my Father, he said, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have eternal life. By doing God's will, he did it for us all. He was our perfect substitute. There always have been those who have thought it beneath God to become a human being. The early Christian church wrestled with a plague of false ideas about Christ. Some said he only seemed to be human. He never really became a human being. So they were called the docetists, the seemers, as the word means. It just didn't seem right to them. What they forgot is that even though God sent his son in the flesh to be our brother, he also never stopped being God. He remained 100% God while also becoming 100% human being. And it's a good thing he didn't just seem to be a human being. That becomes clear in the last two verses of this text. You might say, we are made holy through this body. We read, then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will he sets aside the first, that is the first covenant, to establish the second. And by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. The Lord had ordained a covenant with Israel marked by sacrifices and obedience. But it didn't work. It wasn't the fault of the covenant. It was the fault of the sinful people. So he, he set aside that first covenant, a covenant of law, a covenant of works, and established a second one. It was a covenant based on the obedient life of Jesus Christ. It was a covenant that offered a perfect acquittal, a perfect robe of righteousness, and a perfect reconciliation with God. And it happened through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Here, too, there are many who say it, it couldn't have happened. There's something called the swoon theory, saying that Jesus just fainted on the cross from lack of blood, then recovered in the cool of the grave. Others have supposed that maybe the God side of Jesus actually left his body before he died, so it was just a man who died. But the apostle is clear. We have been made holy, sanctified, through the sacrifice of a body, the body of Jesus Christ once for all. It wasn't a pretend body. It wasn't a plastic mannequin. It was the real flesh and blood body, born of the Virgin Mary, that suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. It was the once for all payment for us. No bull, no goat, no lamb could do what Jesus Christ did for humanity. And it's because Jesus offered such a once-for-all payment for sin that you and I can find perfect peace of heart and mind 
before our righteous God. Allow me to illustrate just how important that is. Matt Chandler, a Christian writer and speaker, tells the following story about the day he decided to hop in his car to drive to the home he grew up in and look at the houses that he remembered from back then. He writes, As I drove into town, I passed a field where I once got into a fist fight with a kid named Sean. It was not a fair fight, and I did some shady, dark things in that fight. I completely humiliated him in front of a large crowd of people. Then I drove past my first house, and I thought of all the wicked things I had done in that house. I passed a friend's house where, once at a party, I did some of the most shameful and horrific things that I have ever done. Afterward, I was overwhelmed with the guilt and shame of the wickedness that I had done in that city prior to knowing Jesus Christ. I could hear the whispers in my, in my heart, you call yourself a man of God? Are you going to stand in front of others and tell them to be men of God after all you've done? In the middle of all that guilt and shame, he said, I began to be reminded by the scriptures that the old Matt Chandler is dead. The Matt Chandler who did those things, the Matt Chandler who sinned in those ways, was nailed to that cross with Jesus Christ and all of his sins, past, present, and future, were paid for in full on the cross of Jesus Christ. I have been sanctified once for all. He remembers my sins no more, and I no longer need to feel shame for those things because those things have been completely atoned for. Friends, Matt Chandler isn't the only one, is he? If you, and, if you are all alone in this world, then you must face your personal guilt before God on your own. But here's the joyful message to the Hebrews and to you and me today. You are not alone. You have a body, a Savior, who came in the flesh to be your brother, like you in every way, except that he never sinned. He pleased his heavenly Father, and his pleasure was accounted to you, as if you yourself had pleased him. Can you ever be the same for believing that? So next week, as we are gathered in church and at home and are reciting the beautiful words of Jesus' birth, don't forget about the bulls and the goats and lambs that little baby came to replace. Take him in the arms of your heart, Squeeze that little body tight in faith and rejoice that in your hands you hold the greatest gift of all, the body of your Savior God. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's now confess our faith in that Savior God in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us, and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead 
and the life of the world to come. Amen. Join me now in the prayer of the church for Advent. Come, dear Savior, we long for your appearing. Come to cheer us with your promises. As you once cheered your ancient people throughout their long night of waiting and watching, come to restore our hope. Rouse us from the slumber of despair, lift our hearts from petty, earthbound goals, and direct our eyes above, from where you will soon come to make all things right again. Come and work in us a godly grief and a genuine sorrow over sin. Forgive us for the shameful way we have dishonored you and the shabby way we have dealt with one another. Through your mighty word, stir up in us a ceaseless yearning to give ourselves to others as you have given yourself to us. Come also to rekindle our joy as we prepare to celebrate your first coming. Do not permit a frenzied busyness to rob us of your peace or to deprive us of times to ponder and to wonder at your word. Set our hearts apart from the bustle and the clamor and the jostle of these days. Fill us with the quiet delight of finding you in the manger, and keep hearts and minds undisturbed by the great throng that streams by uncaring. We pray also for those enduring great sorrow, for those undergoing spiritual trial, and for those whose restless hearts have no knowledge of your coming. Comfort, strengthen, and illumine them with the sweet peace born of your love, and keep them in the way of peace by your holy word. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Come quickly, dear Lord, and fill our longing eyes with the light of your coming. We wait, we keep watch, and in you we put our hope as we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go now in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and grant you peace. Amen. And our closing hymn speaks of peace. Peace came to earth.
We're so grateful that you came to join us in worshiping the Savior online as you have. And thank you also for your generous support of this ministry without which we couldn't do this. It's a special week in front of us, isn't it, as we celebrate our Savior's birth. May God lift your heart with joy that our Savior has become Emmanuel, God with us. Till next time. If angels fill the skies to